Today's scripture reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world, is, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is the word of the Lord. one more time good morning church good morning. happy sunday happy father's day <laughs> happy father's day to all of you fathers um today is an extra special day for me and i'm very excited because some of you may know some of you may not know but i am actually celebrating my very first father's day ever as a father <laughs> thank you <laughs> So it's very meaningful and special. Um, not only that, but I'm also sharing the Word of God with you this morning uh, on this Lord's Day, which makes it even more special. And honestly, I always say this before I begin, but it's a, such a, it, it, it's a great joy and privilege for me to bring you the Word of God. And so uh, I would like to open up this time with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we... Thank you for gathering us, your people, to be able to worship you, Lord, on this Sunday, special Sunday, remembering, Lord, that you have given us salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, that, that is why we're here. That is why we gather. That is why we worship you. And so, Lord, we pray that as we hear your word right now, give us, give us the ears to hear and that we may understand your word that you would speak into our hearts because lord we we really want to live according to your word may you receive all glory this time and as we hear and also from our lives as we apply your word into our lives and so lord be with us with your holy spirit speak to us we love you in jesus name we pray amen amen uh, let's see. Today's message can be summed up this way. Your identity is determined not by what the world says, but by your Heavenly Father. Amen? So there are three things that I want us to learn today. And the first, very first thing that I want to go over is that you are, all of you are, beloved children of God. You are a child of God, that you are deeply and profoundly loved by God. And that is your first and most important identity. Secondly, the way the world treats a father is the same way the world treats a child. Like father, like child. The same way Jesus was treated, the son of God is the same way we, you know, as the children of God, Will be treated third and finally when jesus comes again when he appears to us we will see him as he is and we shall be like him that is the promise that is the hope that we have and that we shall see god right isn't that the goal of every believer to see god that faith will become Sight. So the first point of this morning is, you know, you, again, all of you, whether you are here in person or joining through Zoom at home, you are a child of God. You know, the world seduces people to claim a false identity. The world teaches us that you are what other people say you are, or you are what you accomplish, or you are what you have. 
you are what you own. So in this world, if you don't do well, if you don't have the right people, if you, have, you don't have you know, money or fame, success, you aren't. Because those are the things that identify you in this world. Those are the things that mark you. But the gospel, the gospel tells us otherwise. The gospel tells us that we are not what we own, not what we have, not what we have accomplished, but simply that we are beloved children of God. You see, the world tells us who we are, who you are, because that's just how the world operates, right? You see, it's an invention. It's an illusion that makes the world kind of go around. And it serves, right? It serves as a material for movies, art, and business, and a lot of manipulation in life. It also divides the world into rich and poor, the haves and not haves. But God's word tells us today that we are first and foremost above every other identity, every other category, every other demographic group, every other relationship, that we are sons and daughters of God. Let's look at verse 1 of today's passage. It says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. In a different version, it has that phrase a little bit differently. It says in ESV, What kind of love the Father has given to us? In another version, it says, What matter of love is this? What kind of love is this? And so if you look at the original Greek, it means originally, what country is this kind of love come from? It's like as if the Father's love is so, you know, unearthly, so foreign to this world. And that Apostle John here, he wonders, he's wondering, you know, what kind of country or what kind of love is this love come from? What country does this love come from? What kind of love is this? We're called to remember today our privileges, our benefits that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. It's our privilege to be called children of God. When Jessica and I first found out that we had this little life that had come to us, our son Abe, uh, we decided to give him a birth name. Obviously, we didn't know whether he was going to be a male or a female at the time, but we thought it was a great idea to give him a birth name as we work on our way to kind of give him a real official name, right? And so we named him Chukbok, which means blessing in Korean. And then, of course, we named him Abe, as in Abram later on, but we gave him a birth name, Blessing, hoping and praying that he would be the blessing in our family, that he would become the blessing and, and that he would later on, he would become the channel of blessing for others as well. You're probably wondering, why is he sharing that? I don't know here. I'm sharing this because a person's name truly matters, even the birth names. There's an ancient practice of giving children great biblical names. Long time ago, they did that to teach repeatedly the story of the original barrier of that name, to give them a standard to live up their lives, like those biblical characters in the Bible, as they kind of mature into adulthood, right? I mean, today we give our children biblical names too, right? Hoping that they would live up to that biblical character. Not that biblical character is perfect or anything, but to have someone to emulate, to imitate. So I don't know if you would fully agree with me or not on this, but names really do matter. We bear the name of the family of God the house of, of God. We're children of God. We bear the name of Christ. 
We are Christians. Are we not? The Lord has put his stamp upon us. And he claimed us as his own. Children of God is no mere title. It is a fact. It is a reality. Not only are we called children of God, but we are children of God. Not by nature, but by God's grace. It is an undeserved gift. You see, by nature, a human being is a creature of God. But it's by grace that that being becomes a child of God. You see, this is something we share with all people. Whether you are a believer or non-believer, we're all God's creatures, you know. He's our creator. But by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ, we become not just creatures of God, but children of God. How many of you are familiar with the term paternity? Paternity and fatherhood. Paternity and fatherhood are closely connected words, but they're radically different. Paternity describes a relationship in which a man is responsible for the physical existence of a child. That's what the paternity is, right? You've all heard of paternity tests, DNA tests, so-called. How many, how many of you here ever watched the Mori Povich show? Yeah? Mori Povich. He's become very famous in his show, you know, daytime show, right? For doing paternity tests. And, you know, in his show, the drama of the show kind of builds up until he finally gets this envelope. And Mori, he, you know, takes out the paper out of the envelope, you know, and he declares to the guest, and to the audiences, he goes, when he comes to the father of so-and-so, the baby, the DNA test, the paternity test has determined that you are the father or you're not the father. And then the audience go, <gasps> sometimes the guests go, you know, they're just, you know, shocked, right? Sometimes they go obnoxious. I don't know if you've seen the show or not, but that's what the paternity is. A fatherhood, a fatherhood is different. A fatherhood, you know, it, fatherhood describes an intimate, loving relationship. A man who is in the life of his children. A man who sacrifices everything for his children. So in the sense of paternity, all people are children of God, for he created us all. But in the sense of fatherhood, people are children of God only when he makes his gracious approach to them and they respond in faith. Can you tell the difference? Do you see the difference? All of us can call God a creator. All of us, we can all claim that, oh, he's a creator. Oh, we are the children of God. We can all say that, but when it comes to paternity or when it comes to fatherhood, only those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and believe that, you know, the things that he has accomplished for us on the cross have been adopted into his household, his family. We're all adopted sons and daughters. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 6 says this, In love, in love, God predestined for us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. It is because of our Lord Jesus Christ that we have been adopted into the Father's family. So may all of you join me when I say, I'm not what other people say I am. I'm not what I produce. I'm not the fame I have, not have, don't have. I don't have to walk around trying to, you know, prove myself to others, but that I am a favored child of God. That's what you are. 
Second point, like father, like child. The way the Son of God was treated, it's the same way we are treated. Let's look at verse 1 once again. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Here, the question arises. If people have this great honor when they become Christians, why are they so despised by this world? The answer? They're experiencing only what Jesus has already experienced. When he came to this world, when Jesus first came to this world, he was not recognized. He was not recognized as a Messiah. He was not recognized as a Savior. He was not recognized as a Son of God. He was not recognized at all. The world preferred its own ideas and rejected his. And the same is bound to happen to any person who chooses to follow Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, says this. He was in the world, meaning Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And yet, the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, nor of, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Brothers and sisters, Christians were never meant to be acknowledged, accepted, respected, or popular in this world. Never. Just going to say that one more time. Christians were never meant to be accepted, acknowledged, respected, or popular while living in this world. Never. God never promised us that. I don't know where we got this, but we really have to get rid of this wrong and distorted mindset. Now, if you don't believe me, just look at the life of Jesus Christ while he lived and ministered on earth. Do you all remember when Jesus, he said to the disciples who were following him? John 6, 65, it says this. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. As soon as Jesus said that, in the following verse, it says this. After this, many of his disciples turned their backs and no longer walked with them. They left him. They abandoned Jesus. So Jesus turned to the 12 disciples and he asked them, right? Do you want to go away as well? Do you guys want to leave me too? And Peter says this, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where can we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed that we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, this need, craving, longing that we have for relevance, I need to be relevant. I need the world to accept me. I need the world to like me. I need the world to acknowledge me. That denies the fact, this denies the fact, the reality that the gospel of Jesus Christ is by nature scandalous and offensive. It is an offense. You know, you see the cross behind me? Can't really see the cross because of the projector, but you know, that's a symbol of offense. That's never meant to be something that is, you know, nice and cool. No. That was a Roman device of torture. People used to execute people with that. Can you imagine? Like if someone identify themselves, like their religion, right? If you think about it in a modern terms, the symbol of their religion was an electric chair. That's what it is. That was the electric chair of the ancient Roman world. 
and is never meant to be pretty or acceptable. The Apostle Paul reminded the Roman Christians that Jesus Christ is a stone that people either trip over, stumble over, or the one who is the rock of their salvation. Romans chapter 9, 33 says, As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So think about it. If they treated the Son, Son of God, Jesus Christ, that way, you know, despising him, ridiculing him, mocking him, persecuting him, don't be surprised if you are treated the same way in this world by so-called smart people or enlightened people. You know who I'm talking about, I'm pretty sure. People in this world who, you know, point their fingers at Christians and say, yeah, they're a bunch of idiots. They claim that they're truly open-minded, but they're not. They claim that all religions have validity except Christianity, of course. But we, as children of God, should not be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Third and finally, when God appears, we shall see him and we shall be like him. There will be a true vision and true resemblance, a true conformity to the Son of God. Verse 2, it says, My friend or beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. You know, Apostle John here, he's confessing his ignorance, right? The Christians, you know, Christian is not omniscient. We don't know things. John here confesses that the exact state of condition of all those who are redeemed in heaven has not been revealed to him, right? This is not to say, though, that we know nothing about our future state. But what we do know is that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. When Jesus appears again in his glory, we shall be like him. From the very beginning of Genesis, humanity was created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. All of us, all of us are image bearers of God. That was God's intention. That was our, you know, initial destiny. But we only have to look in the mirror to see how far we have on short of that destiny. But God's word teaches us today that in Christ, we will finally attain it. We'll bear his image. We'll become like him. You know, the goal of every Christian is to see God, is it not? For me, more than anything else, that's what I want. And I hope that is what you want too. To see God. Because that's the hope. That is the aim, right? The purpose of every believer. That my faith will become sight the one whom I love, the one whom I place my trust, even though I don't see him now. I believe that someday I will see him face to face. But this vision of God is not for the sake of intellectual satisfaction. It is an order that we may become like him. See, that's the purpose of seeing God, that we can become like him. We want to see our Father our Heavenly Father, so that we can be like Father, like Daddy. But here's the paradox. 
we cannot become like God unless we see Him. And we cannot see Him unless we are pure in heart. As Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 says in the Beatitude, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So in order to see God, we need the purity, which only God can provide. If you don't have a pure heart, you'll never see God. Never. Why? Because God is holy. God is holy. Only those who are pure in heart can stand to see this holy God. I don't know if you ever heard this story before or not, but there's a story of a poor, simple man who would go into a cathedral, you know, this beautiful, large, big cathedral to pray. And this man would always pray, you know, kneeling uh, before the crucifix, right? And it was a Roman Catholic church. And if you know, if, if you ever seen it, you know, the cross of Jesus, bloody with thorns in his brow, bleeding to death, bleeding out that crucifix. He would come in every day to pray, kneeling before the crucifix. And someone one day noticed him that even though he knelt in the attitude of prayer, his lips never moved and he never seemed to pray. And so this man decided to go up to him and ask, like, what are you doing? Are you praying? Like, are you even praying? Seems like you, you know, are kneeling down like that for whatever. And do you know what the man said? This poor man answered him simply. He goes, I look at him and he looks at me. I look at him and he looks at me. And that is the vision of God in Christ. That the simplest soul we can have as children of God. I look at my daddy and my daddy looks at me. The more we see him, the more we become like him. The Holy Spirit has been transforming us into his image from the day we were born again. Second Corinthians chapter 13, sorry, 3, 18 says, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Little by little, that image that we see in the mirror is being shaped, reshaped, transformed, transfigure before our very eyes into the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. More and more, the family resemblance appears as the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, perfects us. More and more through Jesus, we become like our Heavenly Father. Church, day by day, you're looking more and more like your heavenly father. Because not only are we his creatures, but we are his beloved children. And our father, he doesn't leave his children just as they are. No. His children are becoming more and more shaped, molded, perfected into glory. And someday when we see him once again, when he reappears, we will see him as he truly is. Right now, we see with unveiled or veiled faces. It's like seeing ourselves in the mirror dimly. You know, it's like, oh, I, I see myself through the mirror, like just barely. Have you ever looked at yourself in one of those really old mirrors? It's like you know, very dusty. No? <laughs> you probably, you know, barely saw yourself in the mirror. You go, you know, I, I can, you know, it's not the best reflection that I can get, but it's like, oh yeah, I see myself. But it's not clear. But someday, what I'm trying to say is that when he appears, we will see him and we will see ourselves clearly. 
So on this Father's Day, may all of you become just a little bit more like your Heavenly Father. Happy Father's Day to all of you. Dad, once again, we love you. We truly appreciate you. We cannot thank you enough for all that you have done and all that you are doing for your family. You know, I think fathers don't get enough credit. They really don't. But without fathers, without my dad personally, I wouldn't be standing here before you. Like, no way. <laughs> Without my dad living in this beautiful city, like living in Vancouver, no. Without my dad getting married to Jessica, no. no. Without my dad, you know, to, to have this courage to have Abe and raise him, no. Everything wouldn't be possible. But because of our dad, most importantly, because of our Heavenly Father, we know what it means to love and be loved. So on this Father's Day, let us give thanks to our Heavenly Father as He continues to transform us more and more into the image of His Son. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for being a Father to us. We thank you for everything that you have done and everything that you are doing in our lives. Father God, we simply pray that you would just continue to help us to remind ourselves that we are your beloved children and that we are beautifully, fearfully, and wonderfully made by you. And that in this world, we will never ever have to go through a life alone or as an orphan. Because you have pledged yourself to be our everlasting Father. So we thank you for this privilege to be your sons and daughters. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to show us how much you love us and care about us. So I ask that you would guide us, lead us, make us blessing to others as you continue to fulfill your special purpose for us. Father, we want to become like you. So help us to be transformed more and more, day by day, into the image of your Son. We thank you. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.